Welcome to church, and thanks for joining us. Service will begin soon. While we now, <laughs> now, <laughs> hey, good morning, church. <laughs> we're, we're going live Great. now, right now. How's everybody today? Great. It's a beautiful day outside today, and uh, as we continue on with our uh, engagement project, if you notice in here on uh, this one. The questions in the trivia had a lot to do with all the stuff we've covered in, so far in the engagement project. So I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. Uh, so when we uh, come up through this, this uh, is our, uh, this will be the, the second in the three-part series of the vision of God's vision and learning what God's vision is about. Uh, and so as we continue on, we're engaging with wisdom today in the engagement project. But let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the opportunity to gather here freely and openly today and to witness you in amongst us. And uh, we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've sent upon us in here to be with us and that you are here in the room with us as your word tells us that when two or more are gathered here together in your name here you are amongst us and we just thank you for being here with us this morning we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word in message and in song today and so we look forward to that we open our ears to hear our eyes to see the wonders of your glory and Lord, we ask to open our hearts to accept your message in and to live it out daily as we do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship, everyone. So we got uh, some announcements coming up in here. Uh, good morning and welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're online with us here this morning, uh, tell us in the comments so we know that you're online with us. And uh, we appreciate you joining us online as well as in person today. Um, as you can tell, Pastor Terry is not here with us today. So he's got his 40th class reunion going on out in Clarion, Iowa. So he and Diane are out there today. And so we wish them traveling mercies and everything to get out there and back safely. And uh, I hope they have a blessed time out there as well. So. This Wednesday at 7 p.m., we're going to continue on with the engagement project, uh, which I think uh, a lot of people are getting a lot of good out of. I know uh, for me, it's, it's been a, a great experience to, to kind of go in tandem with the truth project that we've been through. Uh, so this Wednesday, we're going to continue on with a deep dive then into the vision of God and engaging with wisdom. So last time around we had, uh, when we had last week's message that I gave you, uh, we had an engagement there and we were engaging in what? We had three things. We're gonna engage in truth, we're gonna engage in wisdom, and we're gonna engage with grace. So this week we're talking about wisdom, last week we talked about grace. Guess what next week is? Truth. So. We're going to engage with truth then, and uh, God's immutable truth, which means, uh, immutable means that his truth never fails, it never changes at all. So the immutable truth is something that is a basis for a fact. And so that's what God's truth is. So we ask that you enjoy us then on 7 p.m. on Wednesday for the deep dive into engaging with uh, wisdom and then coming up next Sunday we have kind of a double header it's Father's Day right well it's Father's Day and we have church in the morning and so we got a lot to celebrate then but then in the afternoon uh, we are going to again this year uh, engage with the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival for the flag retirement ceremony and then we honor the fallen veterans uh, that we do each year so that's going to be at 4 o'clock p.m. at Lowe's Park in Marion. And so this is something that uh, Pastor Terry and I have been doing now. I think this is our uh, eighth year to doing it together since we started the event. Um, 
Well, I started the event back in, I don't know, 14 years ago? 14 I think years it's 14 years ago. 14 years ago. Um, yeah. To bring honor to our flag, to make sure they're retired properly, and so that we can honor those veterans who have fallen and are uncertain in their time. So we would, uh, we'd like to see you out there. We, we actually read the names of each uh, fallen veteran. Uh, and so last year we had 307 names to read. And we retire a flag with each, each name that's read. Um, and yes, it's very hot near that fire. <laughs> but it is absolutely worth it. Then coming up after that, we're going to jump into July and we're going to have our next men's breakfast July 6th at 9 o'clock a.m. Don't know exactly what the menu, I'm pretty sure biscuits and gravy is going to be on the menu. Don't know what the rest is going to be, but uh, it's always a very good time. We had a great discussion this last time around. Uh, we always have a good devotion time together. Uh, a lot of good discussion on cars and fun stuff like that as well. Uh, just a really great time to have. And they, again, that's at 9 o'clock, July 6th. And so we look forward to that as well. And then following up the week after that is Orange Track Racing. And we have Orange Track Racing coming up again on July 13th. And then right after that, we're going to start up with our Bible series and our Bible Minute series uh, on the Bible from the History Channel. We're going to start that up. It's a 10-week mini-series that is akin then to the movie that we saw in our last movie uh, night, which is the Bible. And so that was an excellent movie as well. Um, got some really, really great news for everybody. Uh, they got the legal disputes with the Chosen taken care of now. Uh, I received yesterday our DVD package and everything so that we can start our Chosen series again. Uh, so we'll be doing that starting in September. And uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. And uh, so we got a lot of great things coming up, a lot of fun things going on. Um, we do have the tiny URL for those who are online. Uh, we'll be posting that up. Doug's helping, Doug and Lori are text back there today. So Doug's going to be posting oh, no. that up online. He goes, well, oh, no. sure. <laughs> I'm going to paste it. Uh, but he's going to be posting that up online so that you guys can listen to the music that we had earlier today. Uh, I went ahead and played a segment from Paul Harvey that he did April 20th of 1965. And it was... If I were Satan, what would I do? And it is so telling. I mean, from 1965 to today, the very things that we are facing today is exactly what he was predicting in 1965. If you're interested, right back to the communion, by the communion plate, there is the actual transcript from what he said in that. In that uh, unfortunately, due to licensing, I can't put it up on the screen for you right now. But... Uh, uh, it is very telling, and, and if you do have the chance, it is on YouTube so that you can go ahead and watch it out. Um, as we start the day today, I, I woke up really, really early this morning. Well, no, I'm sorry. God called me really, really early this morning, and he said, you know, you posted up a Bible verse, and I want you to read it before we start our service. So this comes from Proverbs 8, 1 through 6, and it's, on our, and it's on our subject for today, which is listening. Listen, wisdom is calling out. She wants you to understand what is right. So she speaks in a loud voice. She stands where people will hear her on the hills and alongside the road. She stands where different paths meet. She stands where the gates where people will go into the city. And this is what she says. I call out to all of you, wherever you live on earth, you who are silly, learn to be wise. You who are fools, learn to understand what is right. Listen, I have important things to tell you. Everything that I will speak is right. And again, that's Proverbs 8, 1 through 6. And that is so telling because that goes hand in hand with what we're studying right now in the engagement project and engaging 
with wisdom. And uh, I went on to write in there that we need to engage everyone in our community, in our neighborhood, those that we uh, speak to on a regular basis. We need to engage one another in truth and grace and wisdom. So that when we do that, when we follow what God is calling to do, and that is speak love in truth, grace, and with wisdom, then great things can come of it. He will bless those things, and he will make it into what he needs it to be. And that'll be a blessing for us, speaking it to others as them receiving it. So we need to go forward with everything with those three things in mind. Always speak with grace, truth, and wisdom to engage those other people because what we are telling them is right. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to us today. We open our, our worship time with you here today and ask that we open our ears to hear your word in the message, in the songs that we will listen to. We ask that you would open our hearts to accept your message and to live it out daily. And Lord Jesus, open our eyes to the wonders of this world, to the opportunities to serve you daily. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit, and we ask that it would come into our presence today, and that we would come into a greater communion with you. You so graciously work to intercede for us, uh, Father God, in having the Holy Spirit indwelling within us, being and abiding with our spirit. Holy Spirit, please come today. We stand before you, Lord God, as we gather in your name, with you alone to guide us. Make yourself at home in our hearts and teach us the way that we must go and how we must pursue your word and your works in our life. We ask for you to guide our thoughts and actions and to do it with wisdom, with truth and with grace. We are weak and sinful as ourselves and we do not want to promote disorder, but unfortunately we are weak and we need your strength. Bring us into that right relationship with you today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from James 1 verses two through eight. And we're talking about faith and endurance. And this one really came into play. It was really funny because uh, I wrote my message last week because I was working in St. Louis this week and I knew it was gonna be absolutely crazy. So I, I wrote my message and I chose the call to worship and it was on faith and endurance. And boy, I wanna tell you, I needed this verse this week more than ever. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, Consider an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete and needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is an unsettled as a wave on the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable in everything they do. So when you're faltering and you're being tested and you're having a really, really, really tough time, we need to make sure, this verse is telling us, to make sure that our heart, which drives our actions, and we'll go into some of that in a little while, but our heart is in line with God. If our faith is weak, then the response is going to be weak as well. We need to have ourselves aligned with God. And we face trials of many kinds. And our faith then is being tested. So we're good on this, right? So far? Okay. I'm going to say this to some of you and you're going to say, what? But stick with me on this one. Sin is a lack of faith. Sin is not an overt act. Okay. 
okay? Sin is a lack of faith. The Bible, uh, the writers in the Bible acknowledged over actions as sin over and over and over and over again. But they went much deeper than that. Lack of faith in God's goodness and promises are also recognized then through the scriptures as sin. So if you have a lack of faith, it's actually what they're telling us then, you're not believing in the goodness of God, you're not putting your trust in your faith in God. And when you don't do that, it's considered a sin. Uh, the doubter is tempted to fall back on human experience that denies God and his power. So if we rely on our own selves, then we are not relying on God. And that's a lack of faith. And then that causes us to sin. So it's all interconnected. Human wisdom is based on experience and is not sufficient to meet life's storms, the stuff we face each and every day. We're not strong enough to get through it on our own. We have to have faith in God to bring us through it. Now, we got here a little bit early today uh, so we get everything set up. We always play a bunch of music, and, and so we curated some music in there, and it was from a bunch of Christian artists this morning that were struggling, who've had bad times, who've fallen away, who have had bouts of depression, had to quit performing, and it was <laughs> their songs that we were playing this morning, and it was just like one after another. But in each one of those, they said, if it wasn't for you, God, I wouldn't be able to make it. They had to trust and they had to put their faith and their strength back in God to bring them through that storm that they were facing. That built them hope. And so we heard from Lauren Daigle and we heard from Toby Mack and we heard from uh, Jeremy Camp and we heard from, oh boy, we heard a lot of them. Uh, and Mercy Me, and, and the songs that they sung talked about that struggle. Even though we're Christians, we're still going to face trials. We're still going to face troubles, but if we keep our faith centered on God instead of relying on our own selves to bring us through, that's what makes the difference. And that's what those songs we're talking to us about this morning. Sometimes these things really speak to us a lot. Don and I were talking about that earlier this morning as those songs were playing. You know, that, that hope is what we need to get through each and every day. We need God to get through our storms in our life. So believers in God then, they need to provide needed wisdom for those who don't have it. So as we're speaking out to others uh, in that verse in Proverbs that I was talking to you about, when we're going to the paths where we're going to run into the people when we're standing at the city gates, then we need to speak wisdom to these people. They need to hear this. We might be the only voice that they ever get to hear to proclaim that message. And to do that, then, that comes from prayer and faith. And though we might be lacking in some of those areas, then the Holy Spirit will shore us up. He'll bring us up and, and bring us in. God wants to supply what we lack in our lives. I haven't made it through the call to worship yet. You didn't know that yet. <laughs> but we should confidently ask him with an earnest heart. That means our faith must be strong. In order for us to earnestly ask God for things, that's what it means to come with him with supplication. We ask with an earnest heart, and he will answer those prayers. He gives us that in his word. But if our faith is lacking, we can't go before God with an earnest heart because we're trying to serve ourselves at the same time we're trying to serve God. So doubts hinder our prayers from being answered. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. We cannot expect to get things in the world's way through God. I want you to hang on to that one. We cannot expect to get things through the world's way through God. He doesn't work the way of the world. 
Total dependence on God is the way of prayer. We can't be a house divided. We can't serve the world and God at the same time. God's wisdom differs from the modern technical knowledge that every person prizes out here, if we think about it. Cell phones. People are so engaged in those cell phones. Can't tell you how many times I saw people texting and driving and swerving all over the road. They are so dependent, interdependent, addicted to the cell phones that they put all safety aside. And literally, they die to use that device because they end up killing themselves. The world has put in barriers to God. And the whole thing that we talked about with the, and if you want to read it from Paul Harvey, in 1965 he was pointing out these kind of things. Back then, God was really speaking through him at that time. So true wisdom enables us to do the right thing in the face of moral dilemmas and to interpret life experiences in light of eternal values. In other words, if we put God's values first before those of the world, we're gonna have a lot different outcome, though the outcome that we truly want as a result. And that is true wisdom. God is the source of the wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, respect and obey the Lord. This is the beginning of knowledge only a fool rejects wisdom and good advice. Wisdom is acquired through prayerful communication with him. Prayerful communication. As we pray to God, he speaks back to us and gives us the wisdom to get through what we need to address. So God, as we come into this time of worship today, our hearts turn to you alone. Remove the distractions of the world and fill us with your spirit of holiness that we might gain the wisdom to trust in your word and the truths that we learn from you so that we might share them out with our broken world one neighbor at a time. Amen? Amen. So we're beginning tour six. Believe it or not, that's called the worship. How about that? You want Terry back. Okay, uh, so we're going through the vision of God, engaging with wisdom, but there was so much I needed to say because of this topic. As you remember from last week, I said the graphic that I created says the vision, and sometimes our vision is a little bit fuzzy, it's a little bit blurry. So some of the words on here are perfect, crisp, clean, type fonts. But our vision seems to be a little bit blurry. But the reason our vision is blurry is because we haven't been in proper communion with God. Because he shores up that vision. He gives us the wisdom to understand what we're lacking in our vision. So this study on the engagement project has been an eye-opener for most so far. And this tour is by far no exception. But I think this will be one of the tours that may challenge us the most so far of all of the ones that we've gone through. Now, most of us, when we think about wisdom, think about an old man, you know, a wise old sage spewing his wisdom out, whether we want to hear it or not, right? Well, okay, so enough about me. Uh, I'm with the message. So we learned in Hebrews then that he were, Hebrew word binah, that we learned back in tour one, the na in tour one, and it translates to wisdom, meaning a deep understanding. Now, not just understanding something, but a deep understanding, meaning we have some substance back behind it. So that's truly what the na means, is that it is a deep understanding or wisdom regarding this type of subject. So when that word is used, the na, that's what I want you to think about, is that deep understanding or wisdom. Uh, in my message last week and in our study on Wednesday, we heard about the vision of God and what we need to do is we need to engage all of those people in our community, our neighborhood. Uh, we need to engage them with grace and wisdom and truth. And today we're going to focus on that aspect of engaging our neighbors with wisdom. 
So then we learned that the vision of God is that we as Christian families commit to engage our neighbors with grace and wisdom and truth to the shalom of our neighbors, meaning we want that fullness of God to be imparted on our neighbors and that it be done with grace, meaning being humble and forgiving and that it be done with wisdom. And God never makes anything easy. And I, I know we've talked about a couple of my neighbors before. Um, but, you know, this is, this is not going to be an easy task for us to do on our own, by ourselves. But see, the great thing about God is he gives us grace. He imparts us with his truth. He does it with wisdom so that we can engage our neighbors accordingly. We don't have to have all the answers. Through the Holy Spirit, he will guide us to those answers, mm -hmm. to those guidance. And what happens? Oh, what do we need? We need to go to God in prayer. We need to put him at the first part of the problem, not at the very end when we hit rock bottom and we use God as a crutch. Mm -hmm. God, get me out of this one, and I'll do XXXX. Better make sure you do XXXX because he's expecting it from you. But if we don't use God for a crutch and we bring him in at the very first part, the outcome is going to be very different. We have to do that with prayer, with supplication, with faith. Any of this sound familiar? Oh, it sounds like our call to worship. <laughs> That's why I wanted to go through all those things. It's because it takes that faith. It takes that truth. It takes that supplication in order for God to be able to respond. He can't respond unless we invite him, unless we engage God. So number one, we have to engage God. That's the first thing. That in order for it to be a success, we have to engage God. We do that through prayer. And this means also then that we have to do with purpose and with kindness and love in a timely manner. Now we're going to get into the word kairos here in a few minutes. So you get to learn Hebrew today, and you get to learn Greek today. So we'll talk about Kairos here in a minute. <coughs> and we need to do that in a timely manner, and that it, was, it would be done with words that will enhance the relationship. In other words, you don't go to your neighbor, and you don't confront them with what? Evil words? With hatred? With malice? Will that enhance the relationship or destroy the relationship? You have to go to them with positive terms, using wisdom to understand the depth and the breadth of the situation that you are engaging with them. Therefore, you can enhance that relationship. Otherwise, you'll do just the opposite. So Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside redeeming the time let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt so that you might know how you ought to answer each one so I'll give you a minute so that you can reread this the thing about it is the more senses you engage the more you're going to retain it walk in wisdom toward those who are outside those who are not believers Outside, redeeming the time, meaning make it a timely thing. Kairos, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how to answer each one. So what does salt do? Well, salt enhances what it touches. When we add salt to a dish, it enhances the flavor of the dish. It brings out the nuances in the dish if it's used properly. Too much salt, the dish is ruined. Okay? What we as Christians are called to do here is be willing to listen to our neighbors and as we do, temper our re response to them in order to enhance the conversation. We need to put a little salt on it to enhance that conversation. In other words, we need to listen carefully to what they're saying and then respond appropriately to it. 
I used to teach business classes and one of the things I taught was effective communications. And in order to be an effective communicator, we must listen twice as much as what we talk. Now Lori knows that because she used to be one, in one of my classes. And the truth of it is, God gave us one mouth and two ears and we should use them accordingly. One mouth and two ears. He wants us to listen twice as much as what we speak. And in order to be a good communicator, we have to know what the other person is wanting out of this dialogue that we're having with them, this conversation that we're having with them. And we can't do it if we're talking over the top of them all the time. So we need to listen first. We need to be able to effectively salt that communication, enhance that communication. And we do that by listening. And a lot of times, uh, we feel and act as though we have to, what we have to say then would trump anything that they would say, and then we uh, petulantly jump into our narrative and put it right over the top of theirs and demean them in the process. Uh, and instead of realizing that it's their time to speak and our time to listen, that's where this wisdom comes in, is we have to know when it's our time. Uh, in, the wisdom of that is, that is the time in which we learn something from the other person. When we're effectively listening to that other person, that's when we have the opportunity to learn. We learn what their needs are. We learn what their hurts are. We are opening ourselves. We make ourselves vulnerable to them as they're making themselves vulnerable to us. That's effective communication, coming back and forth. Well, in Greek, we call that a kairos moment. A kairos moment. Meaning it is Greek. In Greek, it means it is the right time or season or opportunity. So it, this is the right time for us to address these things. And we need to be able to use our time effectively, as I said before. And the reason we need to use it effectively is it is our time to listen to what they have to say. And then we temper our response with salt to enhance that communication. I understand what your needs are. I understand what you're saying. Now, that's called empathy. We need to empathize into it, understand their situation, not speak our situation over the top of theirs and our agenda over the top of theirs. And unfortunately, in the world today, we find that most of it is one person's agenda being forced upon the other person's agenda. And then what do you have? You have a vitriol opposition. People are, are completely against each other. And then what do they want to do? They want to cancel the other person out. And a cancel culture is more. Now in the New Testament, we see the term kairos used, and I wanted to share that with you. Uh, kairos means the appointed time in the purpose of God. And that is the time when God acts. See, it's not our time. It's the right time for God to be able to act in their lives. God is just simply using us as an instrument to help that other person out. Okay? That's really important to understand that. Mark 1.15 says, the kairos is fulfilled in the kingdom of God is at hand. You see at any given point, we don't know what's going on in the lives of the other people. And we only learn something, and that only happens when we are a witness to it, or when they are ready to share it with us. That's that vulnerability I was talking about. You are never going to let your guard down, your wall down, to be vulnerable to someone else unless you have a relationship with that person. And this is the basis of the relationship. That takes trust on their part and patience on ours. Patience on ours. Don't finish their sentences for them. Let them speak. Two and one. It's a great, great road to live by. We cannot interject our narrative upon theirs. In other words, their time is not our time. Their time is not our time. That's a hard one to do. It really is. 
It really is. And if you're a fixer, if you're a troubleshooter and a fixer, uh, as a person, if you have that kind of personality, guilty, uh, I want to jump in and I want to fix it for them. If somebody has a hurt, has a problem, something like that, I want to jump in and fix it. But I have to be patient. I have to have, wait till the time is right. That Kairos moment. Wait till that time is right. Kairos is a great thing. It can work wonders in your life. So this is very important for us to understand. This may be God working in their lives, and we are only there to support them, not to impose ourselves and our thoughts on their timeline. It might not be our Kairos moment. It's theirs, and God's trying to do a work through them. We have to allow God to work through us to help them out. That's what this Kairos time is all about. And this is where grace and wisdom then intersect. This is where grace and wisdom intersect. We need to extend them grace and have wisdom not to talk over them. Everyone deserves the right to speak their peace in peace. Ooh, there's a, that one stings a little bit, I know. But everyone deserves this, the right to speak their peace in peace. In other words, don't talk over the top. Don't finish your sentence for it's not the time to finish their sentence. How can we ask for the shalom of others when we don't let them speak? Ooh, another one that stinks. I, I, I tell you what, this was convicting me as I was writing. Mm -hmm. We need to get out of the I mode and back into the them mode. This is the time for us to invoke the golden key. And the golden key is to ask for yourself and you probably won't receive it but if you ask for the shalom of others, you probably will receive it. And this we learned in the last tour. God wants us to act for the betterment of others. So ask for yourself. If you're being selfish and you're only asking for yourself, you probably won't receive it. Why? You didn't ask with an earnest heart. What does the scripture tell us? You have to ask with an earnest heart, with prayer and supplication, and then God will give it to you. But he will only do that if you come to him correctly. So, ask for yourself, you probably won't receive, but if you ask for the shalom, you want God's goodness and fullness to come on that other person, you're probably going to receive it, because God wants you to be able to bless them, and in turn, then God blesses you for doing it. God wants us to act for the betterment of others. And that takes us to the next topic. Oh boy. Having the correct mindset. If you don't go into a situation with the correct mindset, you're doomed to failure. In other words, understand what is taking place. In order to understand what is taking place, we first need to understand the how of the situation as well. The human response system is made up of several components. And I've talked about those in the past, and we've, we've had that in many messages because it's very, very important to us. Our fright and flight response is a given situation, is a learned type of response. So how we act or react to a given situation, it's either gonna be fright or flight, as something is happening to us. That's a learned response, such as, I got a hot stove here, and I got water boiling on it, and I know if I grab a hold of that pan directly on there, what's gonna happen? I'm going to burn myself, right? So either you learn you're afraid to touch that pan because you know it's going to be hot, or you don't and you learn another lesson. <laughs> a fright or flight response is a learned response to a given situation. So, as we go through this, these all come from a survival response to a given situation that we're placed within. A need and fulfillment response as well okay, is a, in response to a desire to fulfill that need, and it's a nurturing response. So there's different types of nurturing responses. Mothers have an inherent nurturing response built in their DNA to take care of that baby when they're born. That's a nurturing type of response that's kind of hard-coded into our DNA, and that then 
trickles over into other things. Men are built to do things. Women are built to nurture things. And that's not tearing anybody down, not meaning women can't go and do things. But that's the type of response that is inherent in the DNA of the person. What I want to talk about now is our belief system. And it's at the very core, it's at the very heart of who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. So let's take a look at some basal information. So we have to take that thinker within us. We take a look at the thinker within us. We would consider our mind to be our thinker and it is concerned mostly with logical actions, logical responses to a given situation, the thinker side of us, okay? And those responses are usually what would be termed mechanical in nature. Here's a given situation, here's a mechanical response to that given situation. Our heart, on the other hand, would be considered to be our emotional center. So what we do from the heart is going to be an emotional response to a given situation. Okay? So Dr. Dell Tackett, he points out in this tour that they have truly much deeper relationship. So come and see on Wednesday. Shameless plug, right? <laughs> okay, but what I want you to share with you today is one of my takes on this as well. The desires of the heart control the mind, and we find this in scripture as well. But I want you to understand that. Uh, that the desires of the heart control the mind. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The heart is the center of our being, our soul. It's not the mechanical organ in here that's pumping uh, blood throughout our bodies. It's much, much more than that. It is the very core of our belief system, emotional response to our systems. The heart is the inner sanctum of our mind. So the two are not separated. They're actually tied together. And the heart is a central core of the mind. And here's what we'll see in that relationship between our emotions and our thought processes. So let's see how that belief system works. The belief system is made up of several factors. Perspective, how we see a given situation, the lens through which we're looking at it, if you will, our perception of what actually is happening there, which is typically a learned response, all right, kind of the hot stove type thing, I perceive that's going to be hot, it's going to cause me bodily damage, I don't want to touch that heat. That's a perception. The truth of it is, if you do stick your hand in that boiling water, you will get burned. Period. Fact. It's a truth. Then we have our thoughts and our actions, and those develop our character. What we perceive, we believe, and our beliefs control our thoughts, and our thoughts control our actions, and our actions are the outward expression of our beliefs that is termed to be our character. Who we are is a basis of what we do, how we do it, when we do it, and that is all based on our perspective, our perceptions, our truth, and our thoughts. So that's when this verse in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, and this is exactly what we're talking about here, that belief system. So what you, what you embrace as your belief system then will control your thoughts, your actions, and define your character. So environmental factors of who and what we surround ourselves with, what we listen to, who we listen to, will affect what we know to be true what we know to be true, what we perceive to be our truths. And this is where we have the world right now. Um, they have their truths out there, which are not based in fact. Um, they have their own version of truth, which may or may not have a basis in fact or science or anything else that is a proven thing but they hold it to be a truth, and then their actions are judged upon that, their thoughts are centered around that, and what happens? They define a character based on a false assumption. 
So they will also affect of our perceptions and our perspectives, which will govern our thoughts and actions and ultimately define our character. This is why we need to be very careful because a lot of misinformation is surrounding us every day. The information superhighway is a great thing, but it's also filled with a lot of, a lot of bad information, misinformation. So we have to be very careful. In the Bible, they call it false teaching. Environmental truth claims may be only partially true, so you have to be very, very diligent in verifying them to be factual. And by environmental, I'm not talking about the temperature outside. What I'm saying is the environmental truths given around any situation and the people and the things that are driving those truths. Truths that they're supposedly is the information. The world today has made truth to be subjective. Your truth may not align with someone else's. And then we have conflict. The basis of that truth then becomes irrelevant to them because this is what they want to believe to be true. Okay? We could go into this much deeper, but that's not for today. So I prepared a handout and it's on the back table. So you can go at it at your leisure. But today let's look at our beliefs as Christians. Our beliefs should be based on truths and supported by facts. If we believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that God does in fact exist, then we have a basis for our beliefs. Correct? So as Christians, if you don't believe what's on the screen right now, you're not a Christian. Because that is the basis of Christianity. That Jesus is the Son of God, and that God does in fact exist. Ooh. But these are the basis for our beliefs. These then are supported in the biblical record and by historical writings and form the basis of facts. When we went through the Truth Project with Dr. Tackett, we went through a lot of those things and we proved out a lot of things to be true. Okay, uh, so as we go through these, as a Christian then, our beliefs should determine our thoughts and our thoughts control our actions. Our character is developed to be reflective of our beliefs. So, what this means is, and I, I talked about this uh, about a month ago, as a Christian, our character should be a reflection of God. And our actions should represent, should be a representative of Christ, of Jesus Christ, as he was our example of being a Christian. Okay? We must represent Christ in every situation. Every day I, I, I pray to God and I say, God, go before me today so that all of my uh, thoughts, all of my actions, all of my words will bring glory to you. Not me. Because it's not about me. So our, as a Christian, our character should be a reflection of God. Our actions should represent, represent Jesus Christ as he was our example. If we represent Jesus Christ to others by our actions, then it means that we must act accordingly and follow the teachings of Jesus himself. So if you wonder why your faith is shallow, it's because you're not doing this simple thing. The most important thing in Jesus' teachings the most important one says, people of Israel, you have only one Lord and God. You must love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second most important commandment is this, love others as much as you love yourself. No other commandment is more important than these. Mark 12, 30 through 31. So if you want to know how you are supposed to act, and what your Christian beliefs are based on, you just had it all spelled out for you right here. And it all comes from the Word of God. Sometimes it's much easier said than done, especially when you're even trying to reach your own family members and friends. Sometimes that's the hardest bit, bunch of people to try and reach. Even Jesus, when he was sent to his hometown, sent to his hometown, 
Notice what I said. Not went. Sent to his hometown. He was not accepted for who he was and what he was. And he was initially shunned even by his family and friends. Mark 6, 1 through 6 says, and, and then here it says, Jesus rejected at Nazareth. <laughs> That's in bold print in my Bible. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And so, think about that once. What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And then he went about among the villages teaching. So here we see that even Jesus' family initially rejected who he was and what he was. But later, James, his brother, became one of the twelve apostles. And he was the first one then to be martyred for his faith in Jesus. So what changed? What changed in his brother James? At first he couldn't accept who he was because they grew up together. They wrestled together. They played together. Okay? So how can you be the Messiah? Until the revelation of God came upon. And God showed him who he was. But did it come from Jesus himself? Or did it come from others? Neighbors? Wow, oh, guess what? It came from others. James came to the realization of who Jesus was through someone else. Your sons, your daughters might have to come to a realization of who Jesus is. Your friends through the voice of someone else, a neighbor that's close to him. As Dr. Del Tackett points out, he has a son that has a wall up to hearing and believing in the Word of God. He's been a theologian his entire life, taught theology in college, brought many, many, many people to Christ in the process, but he has a son that's got a wall up to hearing and believing in the Word of God. It pains his heart greatly as it would our own hearts for our own sons, for our own daughters, for our own brothers, for our own sisters. We each may have a family member that may not be active Christians and we may not be able to reach them with the Word of God. We might not be able to reach them, we, on our own. But see, God's much bigger than we are. Okay? Each of them has a neighbor, and God might be moving in those Christian neighbors to reach your brothers, your sisters, your sons, and your daughters. This is what engaging your neighbors is all about. We not, might not be able to reach our own family, but someone else will, because they listen they'll respond to them. doesn't mean that God's not acting in it. Just the opposite. It means that God is acting in that situation. In the right time. And Kairos moment. We have to be open to that. Not force feeding ourselves upon that. We have to act and interact with wisdom. With grace. With <coughs> truth. Any of this sound familiar? I must be getting something done. <laughs> so, we must be wise in how we approach our family and friends so as not to drive them further away. Don't help them build the wall. 
If they have a wall up, don't help them build the wall. Let someone else help take those bricks away and take that wall down. It may not be on us. God's got a plan for everybody. This may not be part of it. We have to accept that. We have to have the wisdom to understand that and accept it. So we must be wise in how we approach our family and friends as so not to drive them further away. Kairos time will come upon them all and then they will either accept or reject the message. But either way, you will have done what you could do. Either way. If we each do our parts, then the will of God will be done in us and through us. So just think about that. Then pray about it. Then go and do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Wow. That was a lot, God. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, I needed it as much as anyone else. And so thank you for speaking that into me this week and uh, for allowing me to share it with all of those. So Lord Jesus, I come before you now just as I am. And I'm sorry for my sins. And I repent of those sins today. Please forgive me. In your holy name, I forgive all others for what they have done against me. I renounce Satan and the world that Satan controls, all of the evil spirits and all of their works. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you, our entire selves to you today. Come into our hearts. Send us your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, to give us salt for our conversation to temper our conversations, to listen to the other people so that we might be able to help them in their lives. Use us, Lord, today. Use us today. Heal us and change us and strengthen us in body, soul, and spirit as we bring your word to others. Fill us full of your spirit and anoint us to be your disciples today. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we come into our time of communion today, the idea of communion, joining together in a similar response to what was done for us by Christ should be first and foremost in your thoughts. As we join together, as we commune together as the family of Christ today, as the church, we need to be able to celebrate the fact that we have Jesus who went to the cross and died for our salvation. We have to know that who he was and what he did and who he said he was was real and is the truth because that's our basis for so as we come before this today, as we break bread and, and drink the juice today, I want you to think about that, the belief system and your basis, how we come together to edify each other and lift each other up in the name of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus took a cup after breaking the bread and giving it to his disciples. He took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as he did that with the disciples, they came into that understanding of the sacrifice that he was making for them and for us today. And so as we come into this time of communion, we're called to remember those acts and those times. Remember that sacrifice that he made for us, the basis for our beliefs, that he is who he said he was, and he did what he said he did. That's the basis for our truth. That's the basis for our faith. That's the basis for our beliefs. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So now it's time for prayers for the people. And is there anyone who would ask for prayer this morning? Along with all the other ones? <laughs> all right, then. Father God, we come into your house today to praise, honor, and worship your holy name. We lean on you for the hope we find in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 2 in Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us internal, eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage our hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Father, we come to you this morning asking for your healing power to be over the families that lost loved ones this week, especially over the families of Robins whose loved ones were murdered this week. The evil one destroys, but you, Lord, have love and compassion on those who are walking through the fire. We call on your name, O oh God. We ask for you to put Christian, caring people in their paths, to help them through all they are facing each and every day. You are God who saves, and th those that seek you will find you in the storms of their lives. Father, we want to thank you for... Um, <coughs> For the people that were found this week by the Israel forces. Please give them a sound mind, courage, and peace in their hearts. Give them the help they need to get well and to find you in their trials. We pray that all that have been held and being held hostage will be found and returned to their families. Please let the love of Christ be with all of them, and we thank you for the courageous people that are fighting for Israel. Walk with them daily and encourage them. Let your power be with all of them. We thank you, Father God, for the help you are providing those that have been ravished by hurricanes and tornadoes in the past weeks. Continue prayers for the people who are in need to rebuild their lives, that you will give them strength and courage and wisdom to face each new day. Help them in the, in the battles of depression and despair Lift them up and out and give them comfort and rest. Give them hope as each new morning arises. Encourage, encourage them in all their endeavors to rebuild bigger and better than before. Father God, we lift up all who are here and online who are suffering from cancer or any other type of illness, that you walk with them daily, open doors for them to get the answers they need from their doctors. Give doctors and nurses wisdom in how to proceed with their treatments that will benefit those in need. And Father, I ask for travel mercies for all those who are traveling this summer for vacations or work. I ask for provision and help in their times of need. I ask that you will arrive them safely to their destinations. Father, I lift up our children and grandchildren. I ask that you help them make good decisions let your Holy Spirit guide them and lead them on your path to righteousness. And Father, help our homeless to find adequate shelter, food, and hope for a brighter future with you in the midst of it. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Please help us to be kind to one another, Lord Jesus, and with gentle spirits, love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Denise. This brings us to our end of our online portion of our service today. And uh, so we thank you for being there with us. And I am quite sure that our technical expert back there, Doug, has put up that link so that you can enjoy the music that we created for you today and here. And uh, so I know we went through a lot of information today, trust me. Uh, I felt it in speaking all the words. So. Um, on my page there when I was doing this, there was 2,785 words in there. So there's a few, few words written in there today for you. Um, but hopefully Wednesday then, we'll go through the video in here. If you can join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, and uh, we'll be able to enjoy that as well, because trust me, he's got a lot more points than what I pointed out today as well. Um, but it's really uh, one of the tours in here that 
um, actually affects us the most as we live out our lives each and every day. It's how we, how the why and the what that we do as we engage our neighbors and the people around us. Our family is part of that circle as well. So thank you for being with us today. Uh, we pray God's blessing on you as we go forward in here. And uh, we thank you for uh, joining us again. We will be announcing our next movie coming up, uh, which will be in July. Uh, we'll come up with a date in the movie, and we'll have that announcement for you as well. So let's just end this uh, time of worship and prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, we, we thank you for every good and perfect blessing that comes from you. And you have blessed us so much in our lives each and every day. We ask that you would use this blessing that you have given to us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties. What I'm asking today, Lord, is that you make a, a channel of your blessing, a channel through whom your peace, your love, your joy would flow out from us to those around us. Lord, help us to reach out to our neighbors. Help your love to go and flow through us to others. May we be your hands and feet to bless these others. May you guide our feet to places where we cannot go just to be that blessing. May our speech be so that we speak words of comfort and encouragement and speak in truth and in love. Give us the grace and enable us and embold us to be available when others are in need. Lord, we ask today that you would increase in our lives and that you would fill us to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that your grace is sufficient for all of our family, for all of our neighbors, for all of our children that need to hear your word and come into a right relationship with you. We thank you, Lord, that not one of your children is lost to your eyes. We lift each and every one of them up to you today. And we ask, Lord, that that Kairos moment would come into their lives. In Jesus' name.